subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss any video lesson from Rao's IES Study Circle. Join the official Telegram channel of Rao's IES Study Circle to stay updated and get all the materials on the Telegram. The link to the channel can be found in the description box. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from UPSC Civil Services Examination Perspective. Today let us take up the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 29 July 2022. These are the list of the news which we will be taking up for today's discussion and their timestamp has also been provided in the YouTube description. So on this note, let's start our today's discussion from prelims and mains point of view. Now the first news to be taken up appears on page number 10 in the editorial section. Now this news is regarding the recent Supreme Court judgment on PMLA and also the power of Enforcement Directorate. Now a petition was filed in the Supreme Court against the misuse of power of Enforcement Directorate which is empowered under PMLA. Now according to the 2019 amendment, its powers were significantly increased and one of the division bench of Supreme Court had earlier stated one of the bail provisions as unconstitutional because it violated Article 14 and also Article 21 of the Indian Constitution. So to understand the Supreme Court judgment, let us first of all go through some of the amendments which were made in the PMLA in 2019 and how it expanded the powers of enforcement directorate. Now this topic becomes important both from the perspective of GS Paper 2 and also GS Paper 3, particularly GS Paper 3 where this topic gets covered under the aspect of security, particularly money laundering and its prevention and also various security forces and agencies and their mandate. And under GS Paper 2, this topic gets covered under important aspects of governance. Now talking about the expanded powers of ED, particularly regarding the 2019 amendment, let us go through some of the provisions as has been highlighted here. So the first point highlighted here is regarding the expansion of scope of money laundering as per its definition provided under section 3 in the act. Now this amendment has added an explanation to this particular definition of money laundering and this explanation when read along with this particular provision that is section 21u then we understand that the act of money laundering is not a one time act and it can be said to be a continuing offence. Now section 3 of PMLA has defined the offence of money laundering and the 2019 act has further provided for this particular explanation. So the important part of this explanation is that the process or activity connected with the proceeds of crime shall be a continuing activity and continues till such time a person is directly or indirectly enjoying the proceeds of crime by its concealment or possession or acquisition or use of projecting it as untainted property or claiming it as untainted property in any manner whatsoever. So it simply means that the crime of money laundering is not a one-time act and it can be said to be a continuing act if the proceeds of crime are utilized either directly or indirectly. Now the term proceeds of crime has been defined under section 21u. Now it says that it means any property derived or obtained directly or indirectly by any person as a result of criminal activity relating to scheduled offence. Now offences under PMLA has been categorized as scheduled offence under part A, part B and part C. So any scheduled offence or value of such property or whose property is taken or held outside the country then the property equivalent in value held within the country or abroad. Now the explanation added to section 21U with respect to definition of proceeds of crime is that it says that for the removal of doubt, it is clarified that the proceed of crime includes property not only derived or obtained from scheduled offence, but also property which may be directly or indirectly be derived or obtained as a result of any criminal activity relatable to the scheduled offence. Now this means that not only the activity which has been categorized under the scheduled offence under part A, part B and part C, but any other criminal activity which can be associated with this criminal activity. Now this is also referred as predicate offence. That is any activity which can be linked to money laundering. 
Thus, the amendment of 2019 not only expanded the meaning of money laundering, but also made predicate offense or those offense which can be linked to money laundering also punishable as money laundering or related to money laundering. Now coming to the second important part of the amendment introduced through 2019 is regarding section 44 of PMLA. Now section 44 of PMLA provides for offenses to be tried by special court. Now let's understand this through an example. Suppose Mr. A has been charged with money laundering and there are two separate cases going against Mr. A, one in a special court on charges of money laundering and one in a regular court on issues associated with money laundering. The charges of Mr. A are absolved and the investigative agency could not prove that Mr. A was involved in money laundering. And this case of money laundering which started in the special court has now been closed. However, the case regarding Mr. A which can be associated or linked to money laundering still continues in the regular court. Now, it is possible that upon request by the officers, this particular case which is going on in the regular court can be transferred to the special court. And when such case is transferred to the special court, then it cannot be said to be continuation of the old trial or it cannot be termed as a joint trial because the earlier case has already been closed in the special court and this case which was carried on in the regular court has now been transferred to the special court. So this is a new case and in this new case if new evidences are found then the authorities or the enforcement directorate can frame more charges or subsequent charges based on new findings. So this is another aspect which was added through the 2019 amendment. Now let's look into the third point which is very important particularly with respect to section 45 of PMLA. Now in this also amendments were carried on through 2005 amendment and also 2019 amendment. So this provision provides for offenses to be cognizable and non-billable. So all offenses charged under money laundering are cognizable and non-bailable which means officers authorized under PMLA can arrest any person without warrant however subject to the conditions of section 19. Now section 19 provides for two conditions. First is that accused shall be informed of the ground of arrest and the second is that accused must be taken to special court or judicial magistrate within 24 hours. Now these provisions have also been provided under article 22 of the Indian constitution. So this part of the provision becomes important or significant as it overrides the provisions of CRPC or criminal procedure code because all offenses under the PMLA will be categorized as cognizable offense and officers can arrest without warrant. So this gives wide powers to the enforcement directorate to make arrest of those persons charged under PMLA. Now coming to the second important part of section 45. Now here section 45 imposes a twin conditions for release on bail. So it says that a person accused of more than three years shall not be released on bail unless the public prosecutor has given opportunity to oppose the bail. So when the public prosecutor who is the advocate on behalf of the government opposes the bail then it gives very less ground for the person to be released on bail. And the second ground is that the court must be satisfied that if the person is released on bail then he will not continue any illegal act pertaining to money laundering. So these twin conditions makes it very difficult for the accused to get bail if charged under the offenses of money laundering. Now it was here regarding section 45 that a division bench of Supreme Court that is a Supreme Court bench comprising of two judges in the case of Nikesh Tarachan Shah versus Union of India held that imposition of this twin conditions under section 45 of PMLA grossly violates article 21 and 14 of the Indian constitution and hence is unconstitutional. However, the Nitesh Tarachan Shah judgment has been overruled by this present Supreme Court judgment regarding the twin condition and it has now been declared as constitutional.
Now, apart from this, various other allegations were alleged on Enforcement Directorate on misuse of PMLA. So, these other grounds which were charged in the petition was that ED does not disclose the enforcement case information report. Now, this is almost similar to an FIR. This document, that is ECIR, is considered as an internal document and hence not given to the accused. Now, according to the allegation, this amounted to denial of basic rights of knowledge of any charges to the accused. Now, according to ED, registering of ECIR is as per ED's discretion. And after ECIR is registered, ED begins to summon accused person and seeks details of all their financial transactions and also of their family members. Now another allegation was that the accused is also called upon to make statements or provide statements which are treated as admissible in evidence without disclosing the accused the charge under which they were booked. Now generally according to the criminal laws any statements given by the accused during police interrogation cannot be used as an evidence in court of law. However statements made to ED either under threat or under any pressure can be made admissible in evidence and these charges are generally not disclosed to the accused. So the allegation is that this process violates article 20 clause 3 that is right against self-incrimination because article 20 clause 3 says that no person can be compelled to become a witness against himself or herself. So the allegation states that throughout this procedure, the accused does not even know the allegations against them as the only document which contains the allegation is the ECIR report and which is not supplied to the accused persons because according to ED, it is their internal documents. Now another allegation was that PMLA does not distinguish between an accused and a witness while they are summoned. And this is important because procedure under criminal law makes a distinction between accused and a witness. Now another set of allegation is that picking up of cases by ED are politically motivated and based on affirmation from the central government. So more or less these are some of the allegations which has been alleged against the misuse of Prevention of Money Laundering Act by the Enforcement Directorate. So after understanding the allegations imposed against ED and also the expanded powers of ED through the 2019 and other amendments. Let's go through the highlights of Supreme Court judgment as it had stated that there is nothing wrong in the expanded powers of ED to control the aspect of money laundering in India. So after understanding the amendments, let's go through the Supreme Court judgments. So the first point highlighted by the Supreme Court is that mere concealment or possession or acquisition or use of proceeds of crime will amount to money laundering as defined under section 3 of PMLA. So basically Supreme Court affirmed the expanded meaning provided under section 3 and also section 21U whereby proceeds of crime has been defined. Now another very important highlight of the judgment is that the Supreme Court stated that in cases of money laundering the burden of proof is upon the accused and not upon the state. Now this means that the accused has to prove their innocence and state has a compelling interest in imposing stringent bail conditions for economic offenses including this reverse burden of proof. So imposing stringent bail conditions does not violate any of the fundamental rights including article 21 or even article 19. And in cases of money laundering the burden of proof is reversed and it is upon the accused that they prove their innocence. Further, the Supreme Court also upheld ED's power to arrest, search, attach and even seize property in cases of money laundering or in offences related to money laundering. Now we saw regarding the twin bail conditions provided under section 45 of PMLA and here the Supreme Court upheld that is declared that these twin conditions of bail provided under section 45 are very much constitutional. Further, the Supreme Court held that Section 45 of PMLA is not arbitrary even after the 2019 amendment. And the amendment carried on in 2019 is reasonable and has a direct nexus with the purposes and objects sought to be achieved by the Act and cannot be said to be arbitrary or unreasonable. Now, the 2019 amendment provided 
that any offense under money laundering or any offense under PMLA would be cognizable and the officers can arrest the accused without any warrant. And section 45 will override any provision of criminal procedure code. Now the Supreme Court further stated that statements made by accused to ED are admissible in court even though the statements are provided either under coercion or under any pressure or any fear. And the statements given by the accused does not violate Article 20 Clause 3 of the Indian Constitution. And the reason provided by the Supreme Court was that Section 50 of PMLA is in the nature of inquiry and ED officials are not police officers. So here the Supreme Court made a distinction between officers of ED and police officers and stated that only those statements given to police officers during interrogation becomes inadmissible and since ED is not a police officer, hence any statement given to ED or its officers are admissible in court of law. Further, the Supreme Court said that providing a copy of ECIR, which is an internal document of the ED, is not necessary. And the Supreme Court also stated that ECIR cannot be equated with first information report filed in a police station. Here the Supreme Court held that supply of ECIR or providing ECIR to the accused is not mandatory and only disclosure of reasons during arrest is enough. Now regarding violation of Article 22, the court stated that as long as the person has been informed about the grounds of their arrest, it is sufficient compliance of the provision of Article 22 Clause 1. And in this case, it cannot be said that Article 22 is violated. So mere information about the charges to the accused complies Article 22 and hence there is no need to provide ECIR which is an internal document of the ED. Further proceedings under Section 50 are in the nature of inquiry and not criminal investigation and hence ED officers cannot be equated with police officers, especially regarding the aspect of investigation. And hence, the rules of criminal procedure code regarding investigation does not apply to members of enforcement directorate. Now regarding providing stringent bail conditions, the court stated that accused charged under PMLA are a separate class of criminals and the offense of money laundering has been regarded as an aggravated form of crime all across the world and hence forms a separate class of offense requiring effective and stringent measures to combat the menace of money laundering. Now related to this, the Supreme Court also stated that the offense of money laundering is equivalent to terrorism and hence stringent measures are required to reduce the menace of money laundering including prosecuting the offenders and also attaching and confiscating the proceeds of crime, which has a direct impact on India's financial system and also sovereignty and integrity of the country. And lastly, the Supreme Court also stated that inclusion or exclusion of any particular offense in the schedule to PMLA is a matter of legislative policy and the nature or class of any predicate offense has no bearing on the validity of the scheduled offenses. Thus, a wide range of predicate offenses could be made part of PMLA, which can be associated with money laundering. So, these are some of the important highlights of Supreme Court judgment, which upheld the constitutional validity and also the powers of Enforcement Directorate to provide stringent conditions of bail and also its powers to reduce cases or instances of money laundering in India, which can be equated to financial terrorism. Now, the amendments made in PMLA in 2019 was carried through the Finance Act of 2019. So, on this particular aspect, the Supreme Court has held that this matter must be decided by a seven-judge constitution bench as it involves important questions as to which matter can be introduced as a money bill. Now, based on our discussion, this becomes your practice question for your mains examination. The question is, critically analyze the Supreme Court judgment which upheld the wide powers provided to Enforcement Directorate to investigate money laundering cases. This question carries 15 marks. Thus, this editorial becomes very important both from the perspective of GS Paper 2 regarding governance and also under GS Paper 3 regarding internal security and also money laundering. With this, let's take up the next news for discussion.
Now the next news for discussion appears on page number 10 in the article section. Now this news says that what numbers do not reveal about tiger conservation. India must not lose sight of the fact that there are other factors critical to ensuring the survival of this big cat. Now every year on 29 July International Tiger Day is observed to raise awareness about tiger conservation. So it is in this direction that this article highlights the importance of tiger conservation and also certain factors which should not be overlooked as tiger numbers in india have increased by 40% since 2005 so this article highlights that let's not get confused by this number as there are other factors also which should be looked into while conserving tigers so on the occasion of international tiger day or global tiger day Union Minister of Environment Forest and Climate Change along with his Minister of State celebrated the Global Tiger Day 2022 at Chandrapur Forest Academy in Maharashtra and along with other delegates they also visited the Tadoba Adhari Tiger Reserve which is in Maharashtra so as you can see in this map this is the Tadoba Adhari Tiger Reserve and it is also a national park now this article highlights about two important aspects first is the movement of tiger from one tiger reserve to another tiger reserve and the second point highlighted is regarding the genetic drift or variations in the gene of tigers and based on this movement of tigers from one tiger reserves to another tiger reserves that those tigers which are isolated in a particular tiger reserve shows certain genetic mutation or shows certain difference in terms of breeding so on this note let us understand the problems which has been highlighted in this particular article regarding those tigers which are isolated in a particular area or any tiger reserve so this article says that for such tigers which are mostly isolated in a given area they can become extinct in case of any random event or in case of any chance now this can be any natural phenomena or even man made phenomena whereas on the other hand the article says that because of isolated existence of tigers within a particular range or within a particular area this also impacts their genetic pool further the article says that isolated existence of tigers in a particular patches of forest also makes these tigers to lose advantageous genetic variation or other detrimental genetic variants now these detrimental genetic variants can be such changes in the genes through mutation and this can result in genetic drift leading to inbreeding depression now here let us first of all understand what is genetic drift and also what is the meaning of inbreeding depression so genetic drift refers to any variation or change in the frequency of an existing gene variant of a tiger so suppose through mutation there are certain changes in the genome of the tiger and because of this genetic drift leading to inbreeding depression now this means that because of change in the genes through mutation this might reduce their survival ability and also fertility of offspring of related species in this case tiger so here inbreeding depression among tigers can not only reduce their survival but also it may impact the fertility of offsprings of tigers and gene drift along with inbreeding depression can lead to changes in the physical or other attributes of tigers so effectively this article highlights that isolation of tigers in a specific area without any connectivity may impact their survival and also their genetic pool and through research conducted based on samples of tigers the researchers have identified certain genetic variation in tigers population particularly of those tigers which has remained isolated in a particular area now here the article highlights about black tigers of orissa which is found mostly in simlipal so the author suggest that this black tiger is because of genetic effect of isolation and this is the result of mutation of a particular or a specific gene in the tiger and this can also be suggestive of an example of genetic drift however similar feature is not observed in the tigers in rajasthan 
or say in central india because there are certain areas of connectivity between different tiger reserves so based on these understandings this article suggests that there is a need for more corridors between tiger reserves and there is also a need to preserve such corridors from human activity as these corridors between tiger reserves will allow easy passage to the tigers from one tiger reserve to another the second suggestion highlighted in the article is that tiger reserves should not be fenced as it might isolate tigers leading to their extinction and it may also lead to inbreeding depression among tigers which may further impact the offsprings or the cubs of tiger and based on this understanding the article suggests that there is a need to conduct underpass for easy passage of tigers and other wild animals especially along national highways now such underpass have been constructed on the upcoming delhi mumbai expressways so similar underpasses must also be constructed along important areas of tiger reserves so that these tigers can easily travel from one area to another thus this article overall suggest that advancement in genome sequencing technology has helped researchers to find out the genetic variation among tigers and based on this researchers have suggested that different areas of tiger reserves should not remain isolated or fenced and tigers should be allowed to move from one area to another as tigers will be able to take advantage of their genetic pool now apart from these information let us also go through some of the prelims pointers which can be asked in your prelims examination so it starts with national tiger conservation authority or the ntca now this is constituted under wildlife protection act of 1972 for tiger conservation and union minister who is in charge of ministry of environment and forest is the chairperson of ntca further ntca approves tiger conservation plan which is prepared by the state government now another important fact is that india has achieved its commitment to st petersburg declaration of doubling tiger's population much in advance to the 2022 deadline and another term which you should know is the critical tiger habitat also known as the core area of tiger reserves now these areas are also identified under the wildlife protection act of 1972 thus this article sheds new light on tiger conservation in india especially based on the aspect of genetic pool the theory of genetic drift and also inbreeding depression and this article gets covered under gs paper 3 particularly with respect to conservation of tigers the next news to be taken up appears in the business section on page number 18 now this news says that rbi sets october 1st as the deadline for cof data purge now cof here refers to card on file now let's understand this in a very simple and in a transactive way now most of us buy stuffs online either through flipkart or through amazon or order food through swiggy or book movie tickets through book my show now while using these apps what we generally do is that we save our credit card or debit card credentials or details so that we need not enter these card details again and again however the problem here is that in case the account is hacked then the hacker can have all our financial details So to avoid such a situation RBI has set a deadline for removing these card details. So according to the directives of RBI with effect from 1st October 2022 no entity in the card transaction or payment chain such as Flipkart, Swiggy, Book My Show etc other than the card issuers or card networks. Now this involves the banks shall store card on file data so these entities will not be able to save our card details that is credit or debit card details and any such data stored by these entities shall be purged or removed or deleted so there are chances of data security leak in case these websites are hacked and because of this rbi has come up with a guideline which is known as tokenization now taking this step forward in september 2021 the rbi further prohibited merchants from storing customer card details on their servers with effect from 1st january 2022 and finally rbi has decided to extend the deadline for card tokenization 
to October 1st, 2022 as highlighted in this particular news. Now, these guidelines have been issued by Reserve Bank of India under the Payment and Settlement Systems Act of 2007. So, this act says that it provides for regulation and supervision of payment systems in India and to designate the RBI, that is Reserve Bank of India, as the authority for this purpose. And these guidelines have been issued under Section 10 Clause 2 and also under Section 18 of this particular Act. So, Section 10 Clause 2 empowers RBI to issue such guidelines which it may consider necessary for proper and efficient management of payment systems generally or with reference to any particular payment system. And similarly, Section 18 also empowers RBI to issue particular directions in the interest of management or operation of any payment systems or in public interest, whereby RBI can lay down policies relating to regulation of payment systems including electronic, non-electronic, domestic and international payment systems affecting domestic transactions and also RBI can issue such directions in writing as it considers necessary to system providers or the system participants or any other person or agency pertaining to conduct of business relating to payment system. So the question which now arises in the mind is that how would this process of tokenization solve the problem of data security? So tokenization refers to replacement of the card details through a token number. So it says that it's a process of replacing customer's account number with unique alphanumeric token which can be then used for further transactions. Now the token will act as the card at point of sale terminals instead of card's details. So basically the commercial transaction will now take place through this particular token. So this token system will now allow payments to be processed without exposing actual account details and hence minimizes security risk. Further, as per the token system, online portals will not be allowed to store debit or credit card details. Now, RBI, according to the Payment and Settlement Systems Act 2007, can also provide for appropriate penal action including imposition of business restrictions if the guidelines of RBI is not implemented. And as already discussed that these directives of the Reserve Bank has been issued under Section 10 Clause 2, read with Section 18 of the Payment and Settlement Systems Act of 2007. So now let us understand that how this tokenization system will work. So the customers now instead of providing their bank details or credit or debit card details will now opt for tokenization with the merchant which can be say Amazon or Flipkart. The merchant then forwards these details to the respective bank and card networks. Now these card networks can be Visa, Mastercard, Rupee and respective banks can be say ICICI, Access Bank, SBI etc. And then a request for token is raised. And once this request is forwarded by the merchant to the respective bank and card networks, then the token is generated and is sent back to the merchant. Now here you must be thinking that still the customer is providing the card details to the merchant. So this provision of card details will be once. However, the merchant would not be allowed to save the card details but only the token which is generated by respective bank and credit cards network. And based on this generated token, customer then completes the transaction using CVV and OTP. So this completes the tokenization process. So next time, say the customer has to shop again. So once the token is generated, the customer need not provide their card details multiple times and can use that generated token for further transaction. So it says that next time, the customer need not enter the card details and the customer needs to select the saved token with the merchant to complete the transaction. So that token which is provided or generated by the bank for that particular merchant can be used subsequently. Now another important point to be understood here is that one token is limited to just one card and one merchant. So for instance, if someone have a SBI credit card and they generate a token for Amazon, then this token will be applicable only for Amazon and say not for Flipkart or Swiggy or any other merchant. So different tokens needs to be generated for the same card but for different merchants. 
So RBI has come up with the process of tokenization as it adds another layer of security on our online transactions. It eliminates the need to enter the account number multiple times while shopping online. And also the fact that there is less risk in storing these tokens online rather than storing the card details. So even if the website of the merchants are hacked, then it would be difficult for the fraudsters to decrypt the account details based on the tokenization process. So in this article, you must understand the process of tokenization and RBI has set a deadline of 1st October and all card on file data stored by merchants must be deleted or Post. Now this topic becomes important both from your prelims and mains examination and in the mains gets covered under GS paper 3. Now this news appears in the article section on page number 11. Now this news mentions about is the environmental performance index really faulty? Now the environmental performance index released by the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy of Yale University Center for International Earth Science Information Network of Columbia University with support from the McCall McBain Foundation. So this article discusses about India's ranking as India has been ranked last at 180 with respect to environmental performance. Now the three main areas to measure environmental performance index is ecosystem vitality, the second main area is health and the third is climate policy. And based on these three areas, these are the 11 subtopics based on which this index has been evaluated. So on the environmental health aspect, it includes air quality, waste management, water and sanitation and heavy metals. On the aspect of climate, it includes climate change mitigation. And on the aspect of ecosystem vitality, it includes biodiversity and habitat, ecosystem services, fisheries, agriculture, acid rain and water resources. So this article effectively talks about that why India has been ranked so poorly at 180. Now this article particularly becomes important both from your prelims and mains perspective as questions can be asked regarding environmental performance index, India's rank and also the institutions involved in publishing this particular index. And on the other hand from your mains perspective particularly under GS paper 3 in the section of environment. Questions can be asked regarding the government of India questioning such indices as some of the important parameters have not been taken by the environmental performance index. So as you can see India has been ranked at 180 and India forms part of southern Asia. Now another important observation of this report is that EPI projections that is environmental performance index projections indicate that just four countries namely China, India, United States and Russia will account for over 50% of residual global greenhouse gas emissions in 2050 if the current trends hold and a total of 24 countries that is dirty two dozens so this is the term which they have provided will be responsible for nearly 80% of 2050 emissions unless climate policies are strengthened and emissions trajectories are changed. Now if we compare India's ranking with its neighbours, Afghanistan stands at 81, Sri Lanka at 132, China at 160 and Nepal at 162, Pakistan at 176, Bangladesh at 177 and of course India at 180. So even the neighbouring countries have not fared much except Afghanistan. Now according to this ranking system, India has been scored a mere 18.9. Whereas in the three different sectors, starting with ecosystem vitality, India has been given a score of 19.3. In the sector of health, India has been given a score of 12.5. And in the sector of climate policy, India has been given a score of mere 21.7. Now, government of India has raised objections with respect to India's ranking at EPI. So some of the objections which the government of India has raised are it highlights that some of the indicators used to assess performance are extrapolated. Now this term extrapolate means to form an opinion or to make a judgment about a situation by using facts that you know are from a different situation. So these extrapolated facts are based on surmises and unscientific methods. So the government of India believes that some of the parameters are extrapolated and hence do not reflect true picture. 
The second point of objection is that the government of India believes that baseline data does not seem to have been used to provide the correct indices. And further, there has been no explanation provided for the weightages assigned to certain indicators also. The third ground of objection is regarding shifting of weightage on many indicators which has overall resulted in India's low ranking. So it says that for example, for black carbon growth, India's score actually improved from 32 in 2020 to 100 in 2022 and India topped the charts. However, the weightage of black carbon growth has been reduced significantly from 0.018 in 2020 to 0.0038 in 2022. Now this has also impacted India's ranking. Now black carbon are the sooty black material emitted from gas and diesel engines or coal fired power plants and also other sources which burns fossil fuel. And black carbon comprises a significant portion of particulate matter which is an air pollutant also. Now the next point of objection raised by the government of India is that the projection for greenhouse gas emissions has been computed based on the average rate of change in emission of the last 10 years. Now, according to the government, a longer period should have been taken into account and not mere 10 years. And another very important objection raised is that crucial carbon sinks which absorb most of the greenhouse gas such as forest, wetlands have not been taken into account and India's low emission trajectory unlike high historical trajectories of developed countries have also been ignored. So overall these are some of the objections which have been raised by the government on India's dismal ranking or very low ranking on the environmental performance index. Thus this article becomes important both from the prelims and also from the mains perspective. With this let's take up the question for the day. So based on our discussion this becomes a question for your day. Question is RBI has released guidelines on tokenization for debit and credit card transactions. In which among the following ways, tokenization of cards would benefit the customers. First, customers can link a single token to their multiple bank accounts for making payments. Second, card details would not be stored with the merchant and hence tokenization provides added layer of security to customers. And third, tokenization allows payments to be processed without exposing actual details. So the question is select the correct answer using the code given below. Options are A 1 and 2 only, B 2 and 3 only, C 1 and 3 only and D 1, 2 and 3. Now coming to the answer of yesterday, the question was at the national level which ministry is the nodal agency to ensure effective implementation of Forest Rights Act. Here the correct answer is D that is Ministry of Tribal Affairs. So with this we come to an end to today's discussion. Thank you for watching DNS.